Okay, welcome to my lecture here on molecular cell biology. So, if I were to want to study cells, how would I get the cells isolated to study them in a lab environment? Now, the way we do this is we get a tissue holding a bunch of the cells that we are interested in, and there are a few measures of ciphering down this tissue into smaller groups of cells. Now, once we have a small group of cells, we then use things such as trypsin or EDTA. Now, trypsin is capable of taking the sticky pro outside cell surface and get rid of the sticky property. Now, what this does is it begins to isolate cells from this, this group. Also, EDTA is an ion, ion chelator that sucks up calcium and magnesium from the environment, and this calcium and magnesium are used to bind to the cell surface proteins that make them sticky. So in both cases, these cells lose their sticky ability and are then isolated. We can then take these cells individually put them on a petri dish, and attempt at growing them. Now, how do we get them to grow? Well, cells need food and other resources. And these resources include, for food, they usually need glucose. They also need amino acids. They need salt concentrations. They need a certain humidity, a certain temperature, certain CO2 levels that change the pH levels, and they also need a serum, which is kind of strange. And serums come from things such as other, other animals, and they're kind of like a blood suspension that the cells are immersed in. So what's in this serum? Well, there's things such as growth factors and signals that allow the cell to divide and grow things such as insulin, which change the properties within the cell through signaling and allow it to replicate. So now that we have an idea of how to get the cells isolated, what kind of cells do we want to work with? So there are two options here. There are primary cells, which are the kind of normal cells that we understand. They have no mutations that are rendering them unable to do certain processes that would be considered normal for them. So, they're just normal cells, and normal cells have certain certain blocks that stop them from being very easy to work with. These are things such as cell-cell contact inhibition. When cells realize they're in contact with other cells, they stop dividing. In a lab setting, this is not always the best case because we want as many cells as we can get in a short amount of time. Also, the Hayflick limit in cell senescence can be an issue for primary cells because after many replication events, telomeres shorten, and cells realize that division may actually be more harm than good at certain situations. So you can imagine it begins to get very difficult to amplify a set of primary cells. Now, a much easier way of amplifying cells is with transformed cells. Now, these are the classic cancer cells that have no cell-cell contact inhibition. They can grow on top of each other, and they also have no Hayflick limit. They divide indefinitely. And we call continuous replication of transformed cells a cell line. So now, what are the properties of a normal, normal primary cell? Well, they're elongated cells, they grow in parallel alignments, they're orderly packed, there is contact inhibition, and also there are no issues with mutations that could cause 
changes in research and whatever is being done with them. Now, transformed cells are rounded. They have lost their contact inhibition. They're disorganized. They grow on top of each other. And they are mutated. So when you're trying to study these cells, it can be more difficult because there is a mutation that stops them from doing what they should be doing. And you never know with what you're manipulating in your research that it will be affected by the mutation. So in many cases, it's best to actually work with both. So now that we have the cells, how do these cultures grow? Well, there are two options here. So there's asymmetric division and symmetric division. So when cells begin to divide, they begin as stem cells, which are undifferentiated, meaning that they have not went through processes to narrow them down into certain things such as eye cells, liver cells. When they are stem cells, they have no purpose yet. So I will begin with symmetric division. St symmetric division starts with a stem cell, and the stem cell can then divide into two identical cells that are either differentiated or stem cells. Now asymmetric division begins as well with a stem cell, and it will create different daughter cells. So it'll create one differentiated cell and one stem cell. Now, most cells grow asymmetrically, and this is simply because with symmetric division, stem cells can create more stem cells or stem cells can create differentiated cells, but they are not able to create both and continue on with development. This is because when a stem cell creates two differentiated cells, there are no stem cells left, or after time there will be no stem cells left, to conduct differential processes that may be needed at certain points in the organism's life. Now also the issue with stem cells creating two daughter stem cells is these stem cells are not differentiated and therefore there will be no differentiation in the organism. Now the best possibility here is the asymmetric division which is a stem cell that goes into a differentiated cell and a stem cell. Now this allows for differentiation and allows the cell to keep its stem cell reserve. So now I will look at two sorts of stem cells. I'll be looking at embryonic stem cells and adult stem cells. So embryonic stem cells can be grown in a petri dish. When it is grown, these cells come together and create a blastocyst. What we, can do, what we can do is we can extract the inner cell mass from this blastocyst and reapply it to another petri dish with fibroglass feeder cells that support the blastocyst by secreting important proteins and continue to do this until a stem cell line is created for this embryonic cell. And a stem cell line is simply referring to a full family tree of this, this stem cell that started. So what you can actually do with these stem cell, the stem cell line, once it is created, is you can isolate the cells that are created and put them into different petri dishes and modify the environment to change these cells from stem cells into differentiated cells. And through manipulating the environment, you can actually change these stem cells into differentiated cells that you want to have, which I think is a pretty interesting application. So now on to adult stem cells. What these stem cells do is they main t maintain tissues in our body. They are usually located in a stem cell niche, which is adjacent to cells that signal self-renewal or differentiation. <laughs> so these cells are responsible for things such as uh, plant root growth and other processes that continue through the life cycle at, at different stages. So these stem cells are actually more differentiated than embryonic stem cells. And the 
interesting vocabulary term that we can use here is a progenitor cell, which just simply means it is slightly more differentiated than a stem cell from an embryo. And this means that an adult stem cell cannot move back into an embryonic stem cell, but an embryonic stem cell can move to an adult stem cell. Just simply because an adult stem cell is more differentiated. So here, I'm going to simply go through some, some similarities and differences between embryonic stem cells and adult stem cells. So embryonic stem cells are pluplotent, which means they can give rise to many cells. They can actually give rise to all three germ layers. One issue with embryonic stem cells is they are created with a very laborious process. Adult stem cells are multiplotent, which means they give rise to a smaller number of cells. And they can they are actually easier to isolate and easier to replicate in lab conditions. And a similarity between them is they both rely on asymmetric division. Okay, that's the end of this lecture, and I hope I hope everybody learned something and we'll see you next time.